chapter 27 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 26. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know the bulletin says that we're going to study chapter 28, which we are. But we're going to start back in verse 26 of Genesis 27. <clears throat> we'll read ourselves into what was going on here. Esau is going to be cheated out of his birthright. Rebecca, which was the mother of Esau and Jacob, decided that she wasn't going to trust God. Uh, she overheard that Isaac, their father, was going to give the blessing and inheritance to Esau, and she didn't want it to go to Esau because Jacob was her favorite. And she wanted to help God along as well because she knew that God had told her that the older brother, which was Esau, will serve the younger, which means he would be the one that got the inheritance. <clears throat> so she kicked in the gear, a plan, and executed the plan, deceiving her husband, Isaac. He was old. He, had, uh, he couldn't hardly see. And so she commanded her son, Jacob, to be a co-conspirator with her in deceiving his father, and they pulled it off. And they went through all the shenanigans, and Isaac gave Jacob, rather than Esau, the blessing. Now G uh, Esau didn't know this was going on. Isaac had told him, that he was going to bless him, but first he needs to go out in the field and catch some really tender animals and cook up a real nice stew, and then he would bless him. Give him the blessing, the formal blessing, a blessing which is irrevocable, which cannot be taken back. So we're picking it up in verse 26. After Jacob had gone in on his mother's command and fooled his father into giving him the blessing. When we pick it up in verse 26, he's about to give the blessing now, the inheritance. Verse 26, then his father, father Isaac, this is talking about Jacob, his father, was Isaac, said to him, please come close to, come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him and when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, one of, the, one of the dupes was to put on the clothes of Esau so he would sound, smell like the field. You know, we all have a certain smell. Some of us have, well, I'll leave it there. So, <clears throat> he blessed him and said, now listen to this, this wonderful blessing. First of all, he says, see the smell of my son. I like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. He thinks he's talking to Esau. Now may God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth. These are idioms for meaning of the very best that the earth has to offer. An abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you, and blessed be those who bless you. Verse 30. Now it came about, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Then he also made a savory food, and brought it to his father, and he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of the son's game that you may bless me. Verse 32, And Isaac his father said to him, Who are you? Uh-oh, big time trouble. And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. 
Then Jacob trembled violently and said, Who was that that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. I want you to underline that last part. Yes, and he shall be blessed. This is saying that this type of blessing is irrevocable. You cannot take it back. <clears throat> verse 34 when Esau heard the words of his father he cried out with an exceedingly great bitter cry and said to his father bless me even me also oh my father what a sad situation that is in that, that they're in There's, they just both of them found out that uh, they were deceived and and betrayed. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. This is Esau speaking. Jacob means to be a supplanter or a chiseler or a schemer. That's what the name Jacob means. So he says, He's got the right name. He says, he took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. See, he, 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 Jacob had done, had deceived Esau before because he made a, a stew out, uh, here we are again with food, food's a big deal here. He had a, Jacob had made a, a nice big pot of stew out in the, countryside and Esau came in from hunting and happened to come across him. I think probably Jacob knew about where he was going to be traveling. And Esau said, I'm so hungry, I'm about to die. Please give me some food. And Jacob said, okay, I will, but first give me your birthright. What a jerk. And the thing is, Esau didn't care anything about spiritual matters or the Lord or anything like that. So he says, okay. And Jacob says, swear it. And so he swore it. And so that was the first time he deceived him. Now he's deceived him again. And it's big time troubles ahead. And so again in verse 36, the last sentence, and he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? This is Esau talking to his father. This is really sad. Verse 37, But Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do for my son? And what he's going to do isn't going to sound very well, very good either. And Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, oh my father. He's pleading with him. Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Now this is very instructive here. Those that care nothing about their spiritual life, I'm talking about believers now. Those who don't grow in grace, they don't consistently take in God's word. It's not important to them. They're distracted by other things of the world. It's fine and dandy until the time can, comes for them to see what they missed. Every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and answer for what they did with the time that God gave them here on earth. All the blessings, all the grace that was given to them. It's at that time, it won't be, it won't be until that time, until some believers will recognize for the first time that they squandered their possible inheritance. In fact, they will be disinherited at the judgment seat of Christ and they will weep and they will be ashamed, but it will be too late. Just like for Esau here, it was too late. So he wept. Verse 39. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. And by your sword you shall live. There's going to be violence in his life. And your 
brother shall, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless, but you shall break the yoke from your, his, his yoke from your neck. So everything that Esau wanted, he's not going to get. Just the opposite of the blessing is you're not. You're going to live in a in a desert area. There's going to be violence. You're going to serve uh, your brother, and he's going to be master over all the family and all that. This is just he just gets lower and lower. You can imagine he's about undone by by that time. Now the phrase where it says, "But it shall come about when you." become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. He's talking about the descendants and Edom, which were the descendants of Esau, later on uh, did break their uh, control of Israel over them. They had uh, essentially a war. That's what that's talking about. Verse 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. <clears throat> now, you understand that he was angry. He was justified in being angry. But he's calculating here. He says, I'm going to kill my brother, but I'm not going to do it right away. Maybe he had a little sliver of thoughtfulness for his father, for if he killed uh, Jacob right away, then his father's still alive and he would grieve and so forth. But when he says that I'm going to wait until after he dies, after the morning, and then I'm going to kill him. Well, he was out a little bit on his calculation. At this point... Uh, Isaac was 137 years old. I know that sounds old. But he would have a long wait for mourning because Isaac lived another 43 years. He was 180 when he died. I just thought I'd throw that in. So he, he must have been in, in very bad health. He couldn't see. He was blind and so forth. Verse 42 now when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. So the only solace, the only thing that he could get out of this whole deal, Esau, is revenge. He was just counting the days, essentially, which there was going to be a lot of them, uh, before he killed Jacob. And by the way, he never did. But he was planning to at this point. Verse 43. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. I, that just, I, cringe, I cringe every time. This is She's ordering her son, which is 40 years old, around like he's a little child. And he's, he's complying. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise, flee to Haran to my brother Laban and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides. Now, uh, there's nothing wrong with this plan. It's, it's a good plan. He needs to get out of there. Uh, but she's a bit off on her calculation as well in verse 44. It says, just, just go to my brother's house in uh, Haran. By the way, that's nearly 500 miles away. And he, stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides. He was there over 20 years. So it wasn't just a few days. Verse 45. So he says, um, And stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides, and he forgets what you did to him. Now I want you to underline you. <laughs> I can't believe she said that. How about we? It sounds like she's taking no culpability on her own self, and even though she plotted it and helped him to carry it out. <laughs> that just jumped out at me when I saw that. So she says, um, until he forgets what you did to him, then I shall send and get you from there, 
Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? And what she means by that is that if Esau murders Isaac, uh, excuse me, uh, Jacob, then then Jacob will be dead and Esau will be executed. And she'll wind up with no sons. That's what she means by that. So she's got a plan, and her plan is, the plan is, is a good plan in that she wants to save her son's life, in fact, both of their lives. And now, verse 46, this is a little controversial. I take it that she made a good plan, but she's, in a, she's between a rock and a hard place here because Jacob is not going to be able to go to Haran, five, nearly 500 miles away, unless his father Isaac gives him permission. And the reason she's in a bind is because her other son, Esau, has already claimed he's going to murder him. And she wants to get her son Jacob out of there as fast as she can. Like I said, her plan, there's nothing wrong with her plan, but she has to manipulate her husband in order to execute this plan. Because she can't very well go up to Isaac and say, uh, well, hon, I just thought I'd let you know that... I mean, uh, Jacob and I conspired against you in order to get the blessing. And now Esau is mad, is going to kill him. So we need to get Jacob out of here. So let's send him to Haran. She couldn't hardly do that, could she? So she's manipulating her husband. That's what I'm saying. So verse 46. And Rebecca said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. Then you might wonder, what does this have to do with what all this that we're talking about? Now she's ready to die because these two daughters of Heth that uh, Esau married. She says, she told her husband, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If J That's who Esau married, these two women. They're pagan women. If, you, if J uh, Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these, from the daughters of the land, meaning they were pagans, what good will my life be to me? In other words, I just want to die. I can't take this. And so this is an act. She has got to get her son Jacob, her favorite son, out of there. And that's all that this, why that is there, because... Uh, the daughters live right there. Uh, Esau married these two pagan women, and, and they're, <clears throat> they're named early on in the text. Okay, all that got us up to where we're going to start. New ground tonight. We go to chapter 28. Are you all ready? Are you ready? <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to hear that. All right, verse 1 and 2. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him that, and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. By the way, do, don't you remember Abraham said the same thing about, him, about Isaac himself? He told the servant, do not let him marry a Canaanite woman, a pagan woman. He wouldn't do it now. He's going to Jacob. So he says in verse 2, arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now let me see if I can put, um, I'm going to try to do this quickly. I'm going to minimize that. I'm going to go here. I'm sorry, that helps me when I'm talking to myself. It helps me click the right buttons. Okay. I'm going to show you a map of where Padan Haram is. So you get a flavor for it here. Okay. 
This is where they're located, down here around Beersheba, and here's Hebron, and they're going to go up this road all the way up to Aleppo, come across, and here is Haran up in the northern part. This area here is called Padan Aran. If you just go as the crow flies from here to here, it's just under 500 miles. Now, 500 miles is a pretty long trip today. If you're out there walking it and have animals to carry and all, it's a, it's a daunting task. But I just want to let you know <clears throat> that's where they were going. Now, do you all remember anything about this city, Haran? Remember when Abraham was told to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to a land which God would show him, which turned out to be Canaan. This is all Canaan right in here, the promised land. They don't go straight across here. Uh, let's see. This would be Ur of the Chaldees somewhere over here, maybe a little lower. And they just don't go straight across here. Anybody know why? The Sahara Desert. <laughs> so they have to bypass it and go up to Haran. What happened in Haran? Does anybody remember that? His father died. He wasn't supposed to take his father to begin with. And so, but he, he, didn't, he didn't listen to the Lord, took him anyway. He died here, and then uh, he left and came on down to Canaan. So he has family there. He stayed there for years and years. So he has family there. Just thought I'd uh, show you that so you have an idea about where that is. Okay, we'll go back to our notes now. Okay, so her plan worked. She got Jacob out of there without having any blood spill. She had to maneuver her husband. She had to manipulate him, but that was no big deal for her. She's done, she had done it often. Verse 3. And so, uh, excuse me. Did I read verse 2? Yeah, let's read it again. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. And from there, take yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your, father's, your mother's brother. Laban is a piece of work. What's going to happen? Let's, let's, let's think about this for just a second. Here you have Isaac about to go out on a trip, leave all his family, everything, I'm sorry, uh, Jacob, and he's going to leave his family, everything behind, and we're going to see in a moment what God is going to say to him. He's going to encourage him. But he's going to go up there, and at this point, Jacob is still worthy of his name, being a chiseler. God could go ahead and start blessing him in a big way if Jacob didn't need to learn some things first. So Jacob the chiseler is going to go to live with Laban, who is a master chiseler. And I'm not talking about sculpting. He is, and they're going to spend years trying to out-scheme and maneuver and connive each other. And so he's got to go through that, and uh, God is going to tell him, I'm going to, bring, I'm going to bring you back. But I just thought I'd tell you that's what's uh, going on behind the scene. Verse 3, And may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away and went to Padan Haram, uh, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So what we see here is that Isaac is again, so he's already blessed him formally, now he's reiterating what's the blessings that God is going to give to him. In the same chapter, not far from here, you're going to see God is going to bless him. And that's a big deal because one thing for your father 
to communicate the blessing that is coming from God. That's good to hear. It's, and it's, it's, it's encouraging. It's inspiring. But it's quite another thing when God himself is going to make that Abrahamic covenant uh, renewed in you again, which we'll get to in a few moments. So verses 5 through 9. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Armenian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, and Esau. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Haram to take himself a wife from there, and that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Now here you have Esau. He finds out what's happened. Esau is getting this blessing, and he obeyed the command to not take a wife from the Canaan. They were all pagans there. Verse 7, And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Haram. So verse 8 and 9, we're going to see that Esau kind of has a little scheme going of his own. Verse 8, So Esau saw that the daughters of the Canaan of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, and the sister of Nebaioth. Now, that seems pretty innocuous, but what he's doing is trying to get into his father's graces. He went and got wives from his own family, Ishmael, and they were not Canaan. They were not Canaanites. So in his mind, he's thinking, okay, I see what happened, I saw what happened to Isaac, excuse me, Jacob, and he said that uh, he was going to obey his father and he got blessings. So he says, what I'll do, I will not get wives from Canaan either. I will go to uh, Ishmael and get wives there. And, and then maybe Isaac will somehow work me back into the will. That's what he's thinking. But the problem is, the Ishmael was rejected by God already. So here's a quote I'll give you that explains this. This is from John MacArthur's Study Bible, and this is what he says. Marrying back into the line of Abraham through the family of Ishmael seems to have been a ploy to gain favor for his father. Those are verses 6 through 8. And show an obedience similar to his brothers that he saw in verse 7. He hoped by such gratifying of his parents to atone for past delinquencies and maybe have his father change the will. He actually increased iniquity by adding to, to his pagan wives. He had two pagan wives already, and he didn't get rid of them. He just added one more. And that's in Genesis chapter 26, verse 34 through 35. It even names them. So he was adding to his pagan wives a wife from a family God had rejected, so it really didn't do him much good. Here is Genesis chapter 26, verse 34 through 35. And when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Bazemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. That's what she's talking about over here in verse 46, about those two people, the, the wives, the pagan wives of Esau, which was Beri and Elon, B-E-R-I, and Elon, E-L-O-N. Both were, by the way, Canaanite women. You know, you have a lot of different uh, types were in Canaan. You have the Hittites, the... Um, the, just a ton of them. I can't name them at all. So, he didn't do himself any good even though he was hoping that he would. Now, we are now at, uh, let's see, Esau. Da -da. Okay, verse 10. Then Jacob departed Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and spent the night there because of the sun 
The sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. Now, starting with verse 12, we're going to take the rest of the time with, with probably the next three or four verses. Because have you ever heard of Jacob's ladder? You heard of that before? This is it. This is where this is going to occur. And so uh, it's, it's a big deal because this is where God himself is going to speak to Jacob and give him the Abrahamic covenant, the blessing pertinent to him. So let's read verses 12, starting with verse 12. So he, he, he was tired, the sun went down, he took some kind of stone and put it under his head and some other stones as well. Actually, we're going to see, when you think about a stone under your head, uh, by the way, uh, that's not uh, a very good pillow, I wouldn't think. My, what's the guy's name, my pillow guy? <laughs> I know his name, I hear it a thousand times. Michael Lindell, yeah. Uh, he would have a, a if he was uh, there, he'd, he'd have a pillow for him, I'm sure. But it was a rock. But it's, it, you would think it would be a rock, you know, maybe about this size. It's gonna. It's a big rock. It's. I mean, but he, he, later on he's gonna stand it up on end. And he didn't lay his head on it. It was a rock, uh, a rock that he could lean across and get comfortable on. That's the deal about the rock. So, <clears throat> in verse twelve. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So he laid down, and then he has this dream. Now, I want you to put a circle around verse 12, because that is explaining what we know as Jacob's ladder, only we're going to see that it wasn't a ladder, it was a stairway. So let's go into this. I have, uh, I'm going to start with seven points on this if you want to put the notes in a, in a numerically way. Point one is the Abrahamic covenant is the foundation of God's relationship with Israel, a unique people. This has everything to do with the Abrahamic covenant and Israel being God's chosen people. In the second half of Genesis 28, we see this covenant reconfirmed to Jacob at a critical, t critical time in his life. So we have God is speaking to him in a dream. I guess since I'm putting this in number form, you can read the notes as well. It might be helpful. Point number two, God communicated to Jacob by a dream. The Hebrew word that is translated ladder is sulam, is more accurately translated and understood to be a stairway. So you probably never heard of Jacob's stairway, but that would be more accurate. I always wondered how all these, how can you ascend and descend on a ladder? Several people at the same time, and some of them are going up and some are going down. That'd be very crowded. So anyway. Point number three. The ladder sets up on the earth and goes to heaven. It doesn't descend from heaven. That's going to be an important point. The text says the angels were ascending and descending. The ladder goes up from the bottom up, and the angels are going up and down the stairway in that order. Specifically states that. Point four, the angels ascending and descending have to do with their carrying out of the plan of God on earth. They have a job. They, they have to go both ways to carry it out. Point five, so what is all this about? What's going on here? I mean, you know the facts, but what is it all about? God was demonstrating to Jacob certain things about the outworking of his plan. God, guess what? God had the plan for Jacob. 
You know who else he's got a plan for? Huh? Can you do this? For me and you. Yeah, he's got a plan for all of us. That's what this is about. Now, <coughs> verse six, I mean, point six. To find out what this is all about, we need to turn to the New Testament. There's a direct allusion to this episode, Jacob's Ladder, given to John chapter 1. So I want you to turn to John 1, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 43. And I have it up here as well, but I want you to go to your Bible as so you can make notations in it. We're going to John chapter 1, verse 43. Now, <clears throat> I don't have verse 42, but we'll set it up with verse 40, 42. Jesus is going about make, getting disciples. He's telling them to follow him. Verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. So here you have uh, Peter. Peter. And verse 43, and you can look up here as well, or you can look on your, uh, in your Bible. So the next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to, said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. So we find that he's going, right off the bat, he is going to follow Jesus. And he, some, some uh, weren't that ready to do it, but he was. So, verse 45. Philip found Nathanael, which was his friend, and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So what would you do if Jesus said, follow me, and he recognized that he was the Messiah? Wouldn't you want to go tell a friend? So he goes to Nathaniel and tells him, and he says that uh, this is the one that Moses talked about and the prophets, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then you have verse uh, 46. And Nathaniel said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was known as a, I don't know, a, a, a low rent area, you might say. Uh, there was there's places in our country, uh, let's say California. Well, never mind. Um, I probably offended somebody. And so, a Na, a Na, Nathaniel said to him, "Can any good?" thing come out of Nazareth. And look what Philip said to him. He said, come and see. So I have a few points here. One reason that Philip and Nathaniel were able to recognize Jesus as being the Son of God is because they knew the Old Testament. Of course, that's all, they, that's all that there was then. Uh, they knew what the Old Testament had prophesied and described the things about Jesus. So that's one reason that Philip was ready to go right away. He, he noticed that. And the reason, one reason that you have Nathaniel here being a hard case when he says, has anything good come out of Nazareth? It, it, one reason he did it because he knew about the word as well because he knew that Jesus came from Bethlehem, not not. Uh, Galilee. So, or Nazareth. Galilee is in um, Nazareth. So, 
Of course, we know that when Jesus had to go to Egypt, had to flee to Egypt with his parents because Herod was killing all the babies, and when he came back, he didn't go back to Bethlehem, it still wasn't saved, then he went to Nazareth. That's how Jesus got there. But the point is, both of them had, doc we would say, had doctrine. They knew what was going on there. So there's a great principle in chapter 46. So when you have someone who is not responding to your giving them the gospel or you're trying to impart the word of God to them and they're just throwing up a, a, a barrier there, what did he do? He said right here, come and see. That's a pretty good, pretty good proof, isn't it? Come and see. He was going to take him to Jesus himself. But for us, we need to take them and to see something too. You had Philip here taking Nathaniel to the living word. We take them to the written word. That's the best way when someone is going to... Uh, have, be hard. They, they, they don't. They, you can tell that they're, they're going to be a hard nut to crack. You don't have to do anything other than go to the word. That's why we have to know the word. That's why we're here. We're inculcating the word of God into our souls so we can be good and faithful servants. And when we're out and about, we don't know who we're going to run into, what's going to happen. We have to be ready. So whatever the situation may be, whenever it goes south, and whenever you have an opportunity, and someone's being uh, unreasonable or hardened. What, we, what do we do? Come and see. You take them to the truth, the word. <clears throat> Philip's experience was like that of the Samaritan woman. Do you remember the Samaritan woman when Jesus went to the well and he was talking to the Samaritans? And she recognized that he was the Son of God. What, she, what did she do? Well, in John chapter... 4 verse 29 she's going to go tell her friends this is what you always do when you have this and it says John 4 29 she said come and see the man who told me all the things that I ever did same thing come and see again what is she doing she's taking him to the living word and what do we do again we take him to the written word now, verse 47 we have here. Here we are, right here. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now, you think that would be a pretty innocuous verse, but there is something to this verse. When Jesus called him an Israelite in whom there is no guile, Jesus was comparing him to Jacob, the ancestor of Jews. See, what the, Jacob had plenty of guile. He was a chiseler. He was always uh, cheating people. And so what this does in Jesus' answer, he brings up, he, when he says that you, uh, verse 47 again, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said to him, Behold, like, wow, this is actually an Israelite indeed, is, and there is no guile. And we can make a connection as we go through this. You're going to see it. You can't see it now, but you will. That he's talking about Jacob. Because he's going to make an allusion here pretty shortly about Jacob's staircase. See, and he's already, that much, that's what helps you think that he must have been thinking about Jacob when he said that. So, Jacob was a man who used God to trick his brother, his father, and his father-in-law. So, it's not far-fetched to think he was thinking of Jacob. By the way, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, a prince of God, in Genesis 32, 28. That's when he's coming back from Haran, about 20-something years later. He's going to have another encounter with God, 
This time he's going to wrestle with God. But we're, that's, that's still a ways off. That's in Genesis 32. Verse 48. Right here. Now, uh, Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Wow. Well, this would get your attention. Of course, Nathaniel was amazed that Jesus knew where he was when Philip told him about that. And oh, who, who could do that? Can anybody do that? He told him, I know you. He says, how do you know me? He says, I know you. I, I, I saw you when Philip came and told you about me and told you to come see me under the fig tree. Remember? He remembers. Verse 49. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Wow, why does he know that? Because he concluded. A, a, a normal person cannot, cannot do that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm having to go through written notes so I can keep that up on the board. And they're sticking together. There. What was Jesus doing when he said that? He was revealing his omniscience to Nathaniel. Now, omniscience is a big deal because it's explaining one of the attributes of God. And it's, by the way, it's spelled omni-science. Omni, unlimited science, knowledge. God knows all. There's nothing that God doesn't know. And he's explaining that. Uh, he's not explaining omniscience. He's just demonstrating it to Nathaniel. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity utilizing the divine attributes one of his, this is divine, remember, one of his attributes of God, not for the purpose of solving his own human problems, but in order to demonstrate that he is who he claimed to be, the eternal second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. You see, Jesus Christ was unique. He was undiminished deity and true humanity united in one person. Jesus in no way could uh, minimize or set aside his divine attributes. If he could, he wouldn't be God. But when he used them, he always used them for God's glory. He never used them in order to get himself out of a jam. And he was in a lot of jams. They were always trying to kill him. He never used it for that. So we find out that because Nathaniel knew something about God's word, he quickly recognized Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. In fact, there are some, I read this one account that said that when Philip came to talk to Nathaniel under the fig tree, that he was either reading a scroll about Genesis chapter 28 about when I, uh, Jacob had the dream or else maybe he was thinking about it. And you'll see why in this next verse here. <clears throat> or next two verses. So Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. Okay, that's, that's uh, verse 50. So again, I want you to underline in verse 49, Son of God. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. That's, the Son of God is a title for Jesus Christ. He called him Rabbi because he didn't know what else to say. A, a rabbi has authority. He recognizes him as an authority. And then he says, you are the King of Israel. How would he know that if he didn't know anything about the Old Testament? They had studied the New T uh, Old Testament. They knew about it. And then in 
verse 51. This is the, the main one right here. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Does that sound familiar? Now, this is the same thing that was in Jacob's dream except one thing. One thing was different. Do you know what it is? Do you see a ladder or stairway in there? No. This time the angels are ascending and descending on what does it say? The son, of, the son of Man. Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. Now, boy, this is really bad timing right here because we're, we're at a point to where I normally quit, which is, was, we've been here an hour. And let me just scroll. I want to show you what, what I have on this verse, on verse 51. Instead of using... Numbers, I use letters so it won't be confusing for each note. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and then I go to numbers again. One, two, three, four. You, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so I hate to do this to you, but if you want to understand what that means, you're going to have to come back next time. <laughs> But, you know, we can't ignore the clock. But it's fascinating that here you have it in the New Testament. Jesus is going out and he's picking up disciples. And these two are read up on Jesus. They, they knew what to look for. They, now Nathaniel already said, you're the one. We're, you're the one we've been waiting for. Now, why could Nathaniel, who was a fisherman know that, and the Pharisees and the scribes didn't have a clue. And they're the ones that were supposed to be the Ph.D. in the Old Testament, and yet they didn't recognize him, but these fishermen did. It's because by that time, the uh, Sadducees, Pharisees, the scribes, by the way, scribes uh, worked, worked as uh, a lot as lawyers, and they had changed the Mosaic law into being the, the road map for a nation because the Israelites came out of Egypt. They didn't know anything about how to be a nation, so God gave them the Mosaic law to, to work out as a nation. Plus, the Mosaic law was given, especially even the Ten Commandments, to demonstrate that no one can keep it. And you need a Savior because we're all condemned by it. That's why it was given, but they had twisted it into it being something that you had to keep the law in order to be saved. It wasn't that the law was pointing out that you can't keep it. It even says that if you infringe on one item of the law, and some people think, well, the Mosaic Law was Ten Commandments. No, that was just one codex of it. There's over 360 laws. And if you were failed in just one, you were guilty of the whole thing. But they had changed it into convincing the people that you had to keep the law in order uh, to be acceptable to God. That's why they didn't see it, and here this fisherman did. I'm past time. So uh, last thing I do and as a custom is to tell people who don't know where they're going when they breathe their last is that you can know, you can know for sure. The way you can know is by recognizing Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went to the cross to pay for your sins, my sins, the sins of the world. He accomplished that. He died on the cross and was buried, and then he rose again from the grave, and now he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust him and him alone for it. It is only given as a gift. If you try to work for it, you will never get it. You have to be humble and recognize that Jesus paid for your sins. And when you believe and trust in that, in him and his work on the cross, 
You immediately are born again. You become a royal family member of the Most High. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed, and you can do it right now if you haven't done it. And I would suggest that you do. Now, Father, we thank you for this time that we could fellowship together in your word. We see your grace. We see your phenomenal plan. We see your goodness. We see everything that we want to have, and it's ours for the asking. We as believers don't have because we don't ask. We pray that you will take the things that we learned today and file them in our soul, in our minds, so that we can remember them in order to be good and faithful servants, in order to give you the proper glory that you deserve. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.